Today, we're going to deal with something that is going to be a little bit controversial to uh, some of my readers and, uh, excuse me, listeners and readers and uh, some of the um, uh, uh, listeners to the Voice of Reason in general. We're going to talk about the Old Testament of the Bible and we're going to talk about the Old Testament prophets, specifically Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And I want to make several points right up front, and I'm going to make these points in detail as we continue. Point number one, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, was a following in the path of these particular prophets, taking them as normative in his own work. Number two, the prophets were violently opposed to what became Phariseeism and Talmudism. Talmudism is just another name, essentially, for modern Judaism. I am not anti-Jewish. I am anti-Talmud, vehemently anti-Talmud. Number three, that these prophets, according to the Talmud and the so-called Talmudic sages, are burning in hell, especially Isaiah. And I want to give a verbal footnote there to Michael Hoffman, who has shown all of this in great detail, and I want to thank him publicly for his work. And lastly, that these prophets are the foundation of what later is to become orthodox truth, the orthodox universal world. That these prophets have nothing to do with modern Judaism. They are condemned by modern Judaism, and today we're going to talk about why that's the case. What is it that these guys said that got the Pharisees and the Talmudists, who are in fact their successors, so angry? The fact is, is that people like Isaiah, according to the Talmud, are burning in hell because they attacked Israel and that the Jewish male is incapable of sin. Again, Michael Hoffman has uncovered so much uh, material in that regard, and I strongly recommend you support him and his work. So what we're going to do today is explain why and how Christ comes from the prophets, what these prophets said, and in the process of doing that, why the Talmudic establishment is so vehemently opposed to these men and their work, and that these men attacked the very foundations of Israel the way the Talmud understands the concept of Israel. But this talk will also show that the Old Testament, especially the prophets, is truly inspired work and is the foundation of the Orthodox world being the negation of the Jewish Talmudic world. And for those of you who attack the Old Testament, I say that you attack it out of ignorance. You attack it because you don't know what you're talking about. And if you were to get involved deeply in the work of the prophets, you will understand what the prophets really are and their relation to what we now know as the Talmud. And the prophets were some of the most, uh, the, 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 pro, the, the prophetic message is such that it foreshadows everything that we say in our critique and criticism of the Talmud. Any Jew who rejects the Talmud is a friend of mine, but unfortunately they are few and far between. If the Talmud was to be rejected tomorrow, there would be no real reason for anti-Jewish feeling in the world. The Talmud is the albatross over the neck of Jews and will eventually lead to the destruction of these people. However, the prophets show a way out. They all point to Christ. They all point to a way to remove themselves from what we now know as Phariseeism and Talmudism. So in dealing with the prophets, we deal with the foundation of the Orthodox Church, but the foundation of the Orthodox Church is the negation of Phariseeism. Phariseeism is that very eccentric interpretation 
of the Old Testament. And it's that eccentric interpretation that has entered into the minds of well-meaning anti-Talmudic people who believe that the Old Testament is somehow parallel and concurrent with the Talmud. It is not. As Michael Hoffman has shown in detail, the um, the prophets in the Old Testament in general is in fact negated by the Talmud, and that's an idea that I hold to, and I'm going to prove it today, and I'm going to prove it today in a way differently than Michael Hoffman. Michael Hoffman, you know, um, has on, on earth a tremendous amount of rabbinic uh, literature to prove his point, and we need to thank God for that. But, but in my case today, I'm going to talk about the prophets. And I'm going to talk about how the prophets did the same thing that Michael Hoffman has done, and that is to say, to pull the rug out from what we now know as Pharisaic and Talmudic Judaism. Again, I want to stress, Jewishness, not the issue. Talmud, that's the issue. All right, let's start with Isaiah. I want to say that the book of Isaiah is a very long piece of work. It is the entire Bible in miniature. Isaiah explicitly is said in the Talmud to be burning in hell. And here's why. Isaiah says, one day soon, Jerusalem will be overthrown and you deserve, meaning Israel deserves for it to be overthrown. Your bread, your water, your means of wealth and power will be taken away because the Jews kill those who are just, meaning the prophets and those connected to them. God has given you tremendous gifts and you have spat and trampled on them in your arrogance. This arrogance will eventually be encapsulated in the Talmud. And that you love money more than God. Money is your God. So says Isaiah against Israel. That you are wise in your own eyes, but not in God's eyes. You are wise because you say so, because of your domineering nature. Isaiah says, you are wise. You are forsaken by God. This is how Isaiah concludes. Ultimately, Jesus Christ, according to Isaiah, will be rejected by the Pharisees because Jews only believe in men. They only believe in their own power and their own purported wisdom. Their women are... Uh, the, uh, moral and intellectual disasters. All they care about is their appearance. The great prophet Hosea calls Jewish women the the cows of Bashan, the arrogant, makeup wearing pigs. Isaiah says the same thing. God's mercy, the mind of Israel is taken for granted, it's spat upon, it's not taken seriously. Oddly enough, Isaiah says drunkenness has become, and alcoholism has become a tremendous vice of Israel, and that it is your arrogance, the the arrogance of what we now know as the Talmudic mentality. This is the arrogance which will rouse the Gentiles against Israel, and it is justifiable because Israel deserves it. Now, not too far away from historical Israel is the city of Tyre. The city of Tyre is a commercial city, one of the many forebearers of what we would say, like London or or New York City, um, who sacrificed their children to Moloch for the sake of money and gain, which is the foreshadowing of our modern abortion. These are Israelites. These might be apostate Israelites, but they are Israelites. And they are rich in trade because even proper historical Israel relative to Tyre has taken advantage of this trade and that this luxury that the maritime trade has created will be destroyed by God. Tyre 
or the very symbol of later cities like Carthage and London and New York City and Los Angeles. They are symbols of pride and decadence, and as a result, they will be destroyed by God. So I think by now, some of you have figured out why the Talmud has placed Isaiah in hell, and why you should take the Old Testament a tad more seriously, and why you should read Isaiah as one of ours, not one of theirs. Isaiah's social and political theory is of world historical importance. For him to be a citizen of God's kingdom on earth, which was supposed to be Israel, but Israel had spit back in God's face, Citizenship requires the most profound of responsibility. Its day-to-day -day work is constant moral struggle. Struggle against the passions in favor of reason and devotion and the spirit. Isaiah says that the Israelites of old, they were formed by God, and yet they decided instead to rebel against him and to destroy themselves. Ultimately, Isaiah says that the sovereign power of rulership resides in the people, not in the priests, not in the monarchy, not in the military. It resides in the people. Isaiah is very famous. I mean, he was a, an aristocrat of sorts, and he was opposed to Israel's alliance with Egypt and Assyria as major powers, I mean, Israel was never a major power in the Middle East, and he opposed it because he realized that in any alliance with Egypt or Assyria, he would have to honor the gods of the pagans as it was manifest in Egypt, in Assyria. And without making any comment about the paganism of Greece and Rome, the paganism of Egypt in Assyria was based around the idea of child sacrifice, and the idea of child sacrifice concerned the destruction of children so that the adults can have a happy life, which clearly, again, is a manifestation of the modern abortion mentality. He was opposed to the commercial spirit which later on Jews would become famous for manifesting, and it was Isaiah who said that commercial spirit will destroy you because it will provoke the demons of greed and lust and envy against the true worship of God. All social forces, Isaiah says, should be organized in the worship of God, not in the worship of money and power. And yet again, this is what the Pharisees were to do, and this is why the Pharisees demanded of the Roman government that Christ be murdered. He condemns the desire for profit. He believes that this is the spirit of the prostitute, of the whore, and he makes very clear, as does Hosea and Amos and many of the other uh, earlier prophets, Isaiah says that this generation of Israel is the generation of the whore, and we are living in that generation right now, here in 2011. Isaiah is the very negation of everything concerning the Talmud, and yet you have people who have never heard of Isaiah before, certainly have never read his work, will try to pretend that Isaiah and the prophets somehow have something to do with the Talmud and the Pharisees and that aspect of the Jewish world. If the Jews would just go back to the words of the prophets, we wouldn't have this problem, and yet they insist on worshipping themselves in this Talmud, this book of Satan, and this is what they call anti-Semitism. And if that is anti-Semitism, then I guess I am. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the Talmud is the negation of everything that Isaiah stood for and fought for. And if my listeners don't understand this and don't grasp what I'm trying to say relative to that, then I don't know what else I can do. I have given them, given you, the evidence of what this man thought the greatest of all the prophets, other than Christ himself, Isaiah is the Bible in miniature. And so if you still think that the Orthodox Church derives from Judaism, 
or I should say Talmudism, then you are laughably incorrect. Laughably so. Okay, now we move to the prophet Jeremiah. It's pretty clear when you read uh, the book that uh, he has written that he's pretty unpopular with the population as a whole. He is anti-slavery, and uh, slavery was practiced by the Israelites of the time, and he was anti-adultery. And, and oddly enough, he, he connected the concepts of slavery and adultery in the sense that they really come from the same passion for domination. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, we're going to see already foresaw the fact that the Talmudic mentality was obsessed with sexuality and body parts and bodily excretions. No different than the pornography industry, which is very Jewish or or anything else. And the prophets already saw this. Their obsession with things that we would call today like wife swapping and, and, and pornography. He sees adultery as something considered normal in the Israelite life of the time. And and I'm willing to say that given I mean, you know, using modern language, Isaiah concerned oh, excuse me, Jeremiah concerned himself with human rights because he saw these rights violated regularly, economically, sexually, familially, and in every other way. There's a group of people a group of Jews at the time were violently anti-Talmud and they were called the Rechabites. These are people who rejected all forms of civilization and that they lived, um, really, they lived on, um, they lived as nomads without processed foods, without alcohol of any kind. They lived as nomads believing that the most primitive way of life for the Jews, for the Israelites, I should say, they really weren't kind of known as Jews at the time, certainly not universally, um, that they had to live outside of civilized norms. And the Rechabites um, were people who, I, uh, who Jeremiah had recommended to the population that this is how true people of God were to live. They were to live in the most primitive of conditions as they could possibly have because civilization clearly has done nothing but harm to the Israelites. It has allowed them to worship money and power and themselves over what they're supposed to worship, namely God. Jeremiah also is burning in hell according to the Pharisees and their Talmudic successors. It's because Jeremiah held to the view that ancient Israel was based on murder. It was based on death. And that murder derives from all the other forms of oppression that Israel had promoted. Stealing, robbing, idolatry. These are the practices that entered into Israelite worship almost immediately. They never had a concern with the worship of God. There may have been individuals and communities within Israel that did, but Israel as a whole worshipped themselves. They worshipped their own mentality. They worshipped their sexuality. And today we're dealing with a Jewish-controlled pornography industry that controls men around the globe And here we have Jeremiah talking about it almost explicitly. All of these prophets held that Israel worshipped Babylon, Babylonian power and might and money, and her deities, and had largely forgotten about God himself, who had brought them out of Egypt. Now, Jeremiah was preaching at a time of Babylonian captivity. Not so much that the, the Jews had been taken to, to Babylon, but that the, the Babylonian Empire had occupied Israelite territory. But 
you know, he was opposed to any violent rebellion against Babylonian rule. He says that it is God who will relieve you, but I want to say that there's something else here. Jeremiah is opposed to the rebellion against Babylon because he realizes that those who would lead the rebellion militarily are also those who morally are about the last group of people who should be running the state. Victory against Babylon would just mean the local manifestation of Babylonian deities in Israel. And for this, Jeremiah was attacked rather violently as non-patriotic. He was attacked as being opposed to Israelite interests. He was attacked um, for essentially being a a, uh, a non-patriot and was tortured by the regime as a result. There was this old idea that because the Jews had considered themselves supreme over the nations, that therefore Israel was indestructible. This is something that Isaiah and Jeremiah violently reacted against. The Jews have this long-standing sense of superiority over others, and yet the prophets, who the regime if you go to, you know, the university and, and, and major in religious studies, you'll have these phony, fraudulent professors saying how the prophets were Jews, and in fact the prophets did everything in their power to unseat the Jewish, Pharisaic, Talmudic mentality. And one of this, one of these points was that Israel was somehow indestructible because God had created it. Well, God may have created it, but God by now had completely abandoned it. There was no righteous left. Jeremiah made it clear that there's no righteous Jews left. They have followed after money and power and sexuality. They began to worship themselves, fetishized in Babylonian and Canaanite deities, and of course abortion and fornication and untrammeled sexuality, and the women uh, dressing themselves up and wearing all of this, uh, uh, the, the, the makeup that, that they borrowed from the Egyptians um, to ensnare men. All of this stuff, we're suffering with this now. And it's Jeremiah who prophesied all of it. How can you reject the Old Testament when these guys are saying precisely what we're saying against the Pharisees and the Talmudists? And if you want to call me anti-Jewish because or anti-Semitic, which is ridiculous, uh, concerning the Talmud, then call me that. But understand what I'm really saying here. The prophets said the same things that I am saying and what the Orthodox Church and her church fathers and saints have been saying for 2,000 years. I can't make this any clearer. If you listen to this and you still hold that somehow uh, Orthodox Christianity is Jewish, then you're just being dishonest. And you're being stupid. The fact is, is that the Orthodox faith derives from Christ's own interpretation of the prophets, and he lived the life of the Old Testament prophets. Needless to say, given the uh, circumstances of Israel at the time of the Babylonian occupation, Jeremiah was um, put in prison so to speak, for um, treason. But I want to say something else. Um, uh, Jeremiah fought a group of people, intellectually speaking, known as the temple prophets. These were the official regime prophets. These were the prophets who came to the ruling class and told them precisely what they wanted to hear. The temple prophets back then is essentially our journalistic and academic class today. They're bureaucrats who are told what to say, how to say it, and they claim to be critical thinkers in the process of repeating what they're ordered to say. And it's this bunch of people who threw Jeremiah in prison. So when you are persecuted for this point of view, understand 
that you have many, many, many antecedents, many people before you, Christ included, of course, but Isaiah who was murdered and Jeremiah who was thrown in prison for the exact same thing. All right, we will be right back. We will wrap this up when we come back. Hang in there. All right, welcome back to the Orthodox Nationalists. We're talking about the Old Testament and specifically the Old Testament prophets. We're talking about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and uh, Malachi. And uh, we just finished Jeremiah. And um, we're now moving to Ezekiel. Ezekiel is um, different because um, Ezekiel uh, is a prophet of those Jews who live in Babylon. That is to say, those who have been removed from Israel proper and brought to Central Asia. Um, they, um, Ezekiel, first of all, makes it clear that the captives in, in Babylon, they're, they're not slaves. Uh, in fact, if anything, they dominate the state of, of Babylonia. They, they show themselves as being capable administrators, and as a result, the Babylonian government uh, supports their promotion. And that there is regular communication with Judah, uh, the, the old land that they were taken from, um, so this this um, this uh, captivity is not really a genocide by any means. It, it's um, it's uh, they mean even even those captives in Central Asia and Babylon uh, still was able were able to hold land and maintain land in uh, Judah itself. So uh, this was not necessarily a horrible uh, way of living, but. Ezekiel did notice something, that in this exile, the Jews were intensely corrupt, but that this corruption existed because of the despair of the captives. Of course, we know from Isaiah and Jeremiah that this corruption had already been very normal operating procedure amongst the uh, Jews who will, who will soon to become Talmudists and Pharisees. Um, the popular prophets within um, the Central Asian dispersion were vehemently opposed to this old tradition of Jewish perversion, of Jewish corruption, and although Ezekiel says that it really comes from their despair and depression, um, he he doesn't he doesn't um, he doesn't excuse it. And for this reason, Ezekiel too is in hell, according to the Talmud. There were popular prophets who kind of rose up within this um, this suffering community, but only to condemn what had become traditional amongst the Pharisees, and that is corruption, self-worship, and the hatred of anybody who they could not control. They do say something that we could make sense out of, though, and that is that marriage becomes essential. If you are in exile, if you are spread amongst the heretics, as the Orthodox are today, what really matters, according to Ezekiel, is the family. The family becomes the foundation of the faith, because you can't rely on any other entity, and therefore, marriage to true Orthodox people, one to another, creating Orthodox families, is absolutely necessary. And this is one of the things that Ezekiel will point to as essential. I, as a priest in the Orthodox Church, will never, under any circumstances, perform a marriage between an Orthodox person and a heretic. I don't care what they promise me. I don't care what they say. You know, I don't, I don't have a tax exemption from my church. I don't claim my clerical status on my taxes. I pay all my taxes. I will not have the IRS or the government dictate to me what I am to do, and therefore I pay all my taxes. And so I can say to you publicly that I will never Never, under any circumstances you can imagine, perform a, a, a wedding for an Orthodox person and a non-Orthodox person. If I had a tax exemption, I would be forced to do this. 
because the IRS would say that I must conform myself to the ideology of the regime. But don't think that this is crazy. I mean, this is this is something that Ezekiel is talking about in some detail in Babylon. They cannot and will not conform themselves to the Babylonian way of thinking. When you are in dispersal, when you exist in a world of evil and death like we do now, all we have is a love of family and fellow believers. And for those of you who are Orthodox, who will want to convert to Orthodoxy, you have me, at least me, as a friend, as someone you could talk to, someone you could call up and, and discuss issues with. I mean, just for the sake of keeping your sanity in this day and age. But this is exactly, this is my creation. This is what Ezekiel says about those true believers not Jews in the Talmudic sense, but true believers who are suffering under the Babylonian captivity. Oh, and by the way, Ezekiel makes it very clear that no true believer can offer any interest on loans to anybody. Usury is out of the question. This is not an excuse. You cannot use the dispersion as an excuse for uh, economic exploitation. And lastly, Ezekiel says in his famous, um, in his famous writings that it's the individual, not the family or the nation, that is responsible for your sins. It is you and you alone. So, so far we have dealt with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and why they are in hell according to the Talmud, and why they have nothing to do with Judaism according to the Talmud. I'll say it again, if you hold to the fact that the Orthodox Church derives from Judaism in the sense of Talmudic Judaism, you don't know what you're talking about. You're an idiot. You need to shut up, listen, and read. Read what these guys had to say, and then understand why in the Talmud they have been sentenced to eternal hell. And of course we know that in reality they are with God. Okay, the last person I'm going to deal with tonight is the prophet Malachi. The prophet Malachi is the last prophet of the Old Testament. Um, and as a result of that, he is sort of the introduction uh, in between the what, what we know as the intertestamental period, this period between the prophet Malachi and the coming of Christ. And Malachi... Um, begins his prophecy by condemning any concept of the mixed marriage. And he says that any mixed marriage will sap the strength of the race. Somehow that doesn't show up in all the human rights academic departments and websites. The fact is that we all know that mixed marriages, whether they be racial or ethnic or religious, you know, when they have culture at their root, will harm and destroy that culture. In fact, Malachi makes the point that an Orthodox marrying a non-Orthodox will void the marriage contract. Malachi also says that we know that there's this kind of mixing because the priesthood is deeply corrupt. The priesthood does what they do for money. It was the case back then. It's the case now. And I want to say that the OCA and the Antiochians and the Greeks and the Orth- uh, the New Calendar Greeks and the Orthodox Church, they do what they do for cash. I know this for a fact. I have witnessed it. It is perversion beyond your wildest dreams. But Malachi knows something. Malachi knows that the Pharisees are forming into their own class. And he believes them to be arrogant and self-righteous and that the wealthy Jews connected to the Pharisees oppress everybody else and that these people are violently ungrateful to God and that the Pharisees manifest their dominance by demanding that divorce laws be made more lax so that they could go from woman to woman and do whatever they want allegedly under the cover of religion. Malachi makes it clear that the Pharisees already exist. 
They're already fraudulent. They already hate God. They create the group of people that were, that, that will soon fraudulently demand that the Romans kill Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ came in the same spirit as the prophets to cleanse and to destroy. He came to bring not peace, but a sword. And it's the Pharisees. It's the Talmudists. It's the ADL. It's Israel in the modern governmental sense of the word that he came to destroy. And therefore, there is no such thing as a Judeo-Christian tradition or as a Christian who supports Israel, meaning the government in the Middle East founded in 1948 from Talmudists from Ukraine and Poland. But Malachi goes even further. It will be the Gentiles to take your place. You aren't loved of God anymore, Malachi says to the Talmudists. You aren't loved of God anymore. There will be a group of Gentiles following Christ that will eventually come to take your place. And the Orthodox Church is exactly what the prophet Malachi is talking about. The Pharisees, according to Malachi, worship themselves and their own power. They have no sense of God. That there will be something called a liturgy, Malachi says. There will be a sacrifice of our Lord, but that sacrifice will not be bloody. It will not be macabre. It will be, it will be the unbloody sacrifice of prayer, struggle, and the liturgy. There's no respect to, to ritual. There'll be a new ritual divi- uh, that will to come into existence. But, you know, Malachi attacks his, his, um, co-religionist at the time and he says that no one takes the ritual seriously anymore because no one believes in God anymore. But what do they believe in? They believe in themselves, which is another way of saying the Talmud will teach that the Pharisees worship themselves as God. We're still suffering with that today. Even, I mean, Malachi will go so far that the Jews have become so fanatically atheistic and materialist that they will no longer support the temple. They will support only themselves and their power. But something happens as Malachi is writing his prophecy. And it kind of, you know, splits it in half as you're reading this thing that the Greeks, those of us who will become Orthodox, will destroy the Persian fleet, i.e. the um, Central Asian fleet of the Babylonians at Salamis. Egypt then will revolt, creating a new power to the west of Babylon. The defeat of the Babylonian fleet is the beginning of the end of this world of power and passion. And many in Central Asia who believed in the prophetic message revolted and they joined themselves with the Egyptians. And this is why ultimately the temple was to be rebuilt. The rebuilding of the temple means the possibility for the development not of the love of God, but political influence. The fact is that the Persian regime, what we would call the Babylonian regime, had created the materialistic ontology of modern Jewry. But you know what? Even as that was going on, Malachi says that there are major crop failure, uh, crop failures amongst Jewish owned farms in Central Asia. And that Malachi says that this hardens the world of the true Jews against God, leaving only a tiny remnant. And that this remnant will eventually come and consolidate around our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, 
Jesus Christ comes in the beginning of the New Testament. True Jews come to understand because of the problems in Babylonia that truth exists in weakness. Truth exists in a little baby born in Bethlehem that will take human nature to himself and purify it with the divine nature as the great fathers like St. Athanasius will say, as the Orthodox Church will base its entire life on, we all have the Pharisee and the Talmudist within us. This is the problem. The ascetic life, the life of self-denial, this will change everything. This will change how we live. This will change how we are. The problem is, is that by the time of Christ's manifestation, in this world, the Jewish worldview will revolve around the Babylonian mysteries of the Talmud, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, what is ultimately the magical materialist class of elites that will continue to rule from the Pharisees to the Federal Reserve of the United States, revolving around the idea of alchemy creating power out of nothing because we claim its power. And then what is left? What is left is a small remnant of those true Jews, non-Talmudic, non-Pharisaic, non-Sadduceic Jews who are known as the Orthodox traditionalists in the Orthodox, the true Orthodox world and that we are the only source of resistance against the regime. And I want to say to those who reject the Old Testament, you are stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. And if you don't know the sources, then you have no right to an opinion concerning those sources. So what I ask you to do is to read these people, to understand what they're trying to say, and then maybe you will have an opinion that we can take seriously. The Babylonian captivity meant that the so-called Jews who lived there created the pagan world. This is why when Julian the Apostate took over the Roman throne and attempted to destroy the Orthodox faith, he went straight to the Jews for assistance. That every heretical group that ever existed Everybody from the Aryans to the Marxists, they went straight to the Jews for assistance. What you need to do is humble yourself, understand your limitations, and give yourself over to Jesus Christ, who in fact is understood as both God and man, and yet, from the point of view of the day-to-day the day-to-day critique of the world, comes directly from these prophets. These prophets created ourselves, our critique, our life. And unless you understand this, you don't know anything. If you believe somehow that Christianity is Jewish, you know, in, in the orthodox sense of the word, then you don't know what you're talking about. You're just another deluded, ignorant, screwed up person manipulated by the regime. What else is new? Anyway, I appreciate those who listen. I appreciate those who agree as well as disagree. And I will talk to you very, very soon. Goodbye and God bless.